Lord, we thank you once again for this day, a chance to be together, uh, a day that you've made, the life that you sustain uh, of the whole cosmos and us within it. And uh, we look to you for your sustaining power today um, and in the weeks to come. Um, I think based on the reaction I just got, I'm not the only one who's feeling uh, taxed and maybe a little burdened and like there's a lot going on and it's, it's full, it's good, good stuff, but um, it's just a lot. And so we pray for your strength for us. We pray also for uh, your rest uh, that you would remind us and invite us into times of rest and that we would take advantage of those so that our work can not only be um, more efficient and healthy, but can be rightly directed toward your purposes. And um, we also pray that this class would be rightly directed, that you would guide our minds, guide our mouths, um, help us to enjoy the discussion, and most of all, Lord, to hear uh, from you and to listen to what you have to say to us. I pray that we would listen the way um, Moses challenged Israel to listen, to hear internalize, uh, integrate your word into our lives so that it can bear fruit because that's what it's designed to do. So um, teach us today, we ask, and uh, help us to be good students. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Mostly what I want to do is uh, kind of use the Reeves chapters as a starting point to um, build on some ideas that he presents there. Um, and so hopefully you've read, if not, this will hopefully give you motivation to, um, to go back to that today. Um, I did put a discussion up yesterday. Sorry it took me so long. Um, but it's open until the end of today, so you should be you should still have time after class if you didn't get to that um, before. But as Reeves has been doing throughout this book, he starts with kind of this uh, comparison between or this thought experiment. What would it be like if God was a different kind of being? Um, and that changes everything. So um, let's let's play that game for a second. Um, he talks about it in terms of sin and salvation. So let's assume for a minute that God is one of, like the gods of paganism, um, the gods of Canaan and Babylon and those places that we've learned a little bit about, or even the gods of the Greek pantheon. Um, for them, what is the problem with humans? Yeah. Um, would it be that sin would be defined as simply disobedience, just not wanting to submit and do whatever they want. Yeah, that's part of it. And that's sort of the, the foil that Reeves uses of a God who's like a single person and a ruler, right? What he wants is servants to do his will. This actually is a pretty common focus in I think a lot of contemporary Christian circles. And it is that because there's truth in that. Um, and that's what Reeves points out. Like God is a ruler. He is just and a judge. And he does uh, ask for and even demand obedience. But then he goes on to say, 
that the story is actually the story of sin and salvation is actually much deeper than that. Um, if we go to the story of like pagan gods, it's it's not even. I mean, part of it's obedience, but for them, it's defined as like meet my needs. Remember, um, I think we talked about this a little bit. How you know the gods of? In fact, somebody gave a presentation where they talked about. Um, the, the gods of the nations around Israel and the way they created and, and part of their even motivation for making people was to do, to be slave labor on earth, which basically amounted to tend the, tend the, the, you know, the fields so that, and race animals so that you can bring sacrifices so that we have something to eat. Right. So that we can kind of relax and um, by the pool and eat grapes and uh, be fanned by beautiful women. And you can keep the food um, production going so that we have lots to feast on. Right. Um, and so that means that this notion of sacrifice is really important because that's how the gods get their food. Um, so in that scenario, what does sin look like? Yeah, Tim. See if you can shout. No, he's not going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to try to shout. <laughs> yeah, I can hear that. Oh, okay. So what I was thinking about through this whole time is that it's subjective. So God's, God's rules for what sin is is completely objective, right? He has a set of sort of criteria, and not, not like a checklist that gets pretty complicated, but it's always the same. It's always this is right and this is wrong. And that doesn't change ever, but for the gods of, you know, the nations and such, their, sub, their standards are subjective. The gods will change, you know, be like, well, I want you to sacrifice this today instead of this. It's constantly changing and shifting and the gods are opposing each other and some gods have different wills than other gods and they fight and stuff like that yeah so there's a little bit of maybe uncertainty or mystery but what does this god actually want from me and they're not really forthcoming always about what they want you kind of have to guess and try and um you know th they're um pretty ravenous uh I just read a, an amazing story. I've probably mentioned this already, but the book Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. And in it, there's this pagan god that um, is like the god of beauty. But at the beginning, everything's going bad in the kingdom. And so the priest comes and says basically to the king, the god wants one of your children. Right, and so they do this whole sacrifice of uh, one of the one of the princes, princesses, and um, you know why? I don't know. The gods like to drink blood or something, but but there's sort of these uh, pretty dehumanizing demands, and. Um, and you're right, not always consistent, but it's it's about um, giving the proper sacrifices to meet the God's needs. So, and then back to your comment about kind of God's standard being um, objective and unchanging, that a lot of times goes with that like ruler judge kind of picture that we mentioned a minute ago where the standard is X, you know, it's this, but it's so high, which is also true. Um, and so what does sin look like for that God? This is the one he talks about on page 63. Let me read you a little quote. 
Um, the answer, he, so he talks about, you know, why is the world bent? What went wrong? He says, to answer that question really depends on what was originally right. And what right looks like depends on what sort of God you have. Take, for instance, the single person God. This God didn't create out of overflowing love. He created merely to rule and be served. In which case, right means nothing more than right behavior. Assuming this God, what went wrong? Quite simply, Adam and Eve did not... Uh, Adam and Eve did what God had told them not to do. They failed to obey. So, for the ruler God, sin is law-breaking. And he goes on. Now, at one level, that is exactly what we see in Genesis 3. The Lord commanded Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but Adam and Eve did just that. But that answer does not actually plumb down anywhere near far enough. So then he goes on to kind of define sin in what I think are more biblical terms. How does, do you remember how he does that? Like if, if we envision God the way he's trying to uh, propose in this book as, as a triune father, son, and spirit. Now what does sin look like? Yeah, Liz. As loving anything else, specifically ourselves, more than we love God. Yes. Yeah, it's it's disordered love, right? Which is going to produce disobedience, but it's way bigger, right? And therefore, salvation is not just behavior modification so we obey right. But it's a reorienting of our loves. So I'm going to put this. Can you guys see that? No, you can't because I haven't shared the screen. Um, let me try this. Now you probably are seeing. There we go. Okay, so this is a, an attempt to summarize what we just talked about. The ravenous pagan gods, the problem is we don't meet their needs right. We don't sacrifice correctly. And salvation is do the sacrifices right so we can propitiate and placate these kind of mean, capricious gods. We can pacify their anger, right? For the ruler judge, the problem is law-breaking and the solution, salvation comes through obedience. Um, but it doesn't have to come from a heart transformation that produces obedience. It really just needs to be obedience, however we get there. For the Father, Son, and Spirit, God, the, the God that um, Reeves is saying, this is the God who is love, then the problem is turning away from loving God to loving ourselves which is rooted in a relational problem, right? The problem is that we don't believe or trust what God says about himself. I wish there was a word, a single word, like in the, in the Bible, belief and trust are typically English translations of the same um, original language words that mean to believe or trust. <laughs> Um, but we kind of differentiate those things. I wish there was a, a word called distrust. Maybe there is, but it doesn't sound quite right. Um, because this notion of trust or relying on, um, and, and remember how, uh, who was it that differentiated belief and to believe and to believe in? I think that was J.I. Packer earlier in the semester. To, to like, uh, build your life on and depend on. So what Adam and Eve did was they decided God wasn't trustworthy. And so they um, decided to make their own version of right and wrong. And um, that included re 
remember, taking what they desired. So their desires were for them, were turned in on themselves rather than realizing that they were made to desire God. And so all that relational um, and um, kind of change in their affections is what leads to the disobedience. It's not just um, that disobedience is like its own isolated thing. So this, the problem that, that is solved then when our loves get reoriented. And Reeves makes the case that the way that happens is through our union with the one who truly loves God, which I think is such a game changer. Because what does that mean? Like, who... Um, who carries the load of changing us? Is it just that we grit our teeth and say, okay, I'm going to love God now. Matthew's shaking his head. No. What is it instead? John 17, 17. Mm. You want to quote that? Yeah, let me find it. It says, it's Jesus praying. And maybe you could twist the laptop just brief, just a little bit while you're talking. Send your, oh, pick up your voice a little better. So John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by the truth your word is truth so it's god the father through the holy spirit and the word that carries the load of even sanctifying us yeah and then he goes on to talk about how he wants uh to share the love that god has for him with us and uh bring us into union with him so that we can love the father rightly. Uh, so, and all of it rests on this idea that we are connected with the son, not that we're off on our own somewhere trying to figure out or, or drudge up the willpower to love God rightly. So, uh, in, in maybe in um, Reeves' language, God gives us Himself, and by giving us Himself and uniting us to Himself, He transforms us into a different kind of self. So, um, let me see if I can make this. Here we go. What's next? So. Um, I was thinking about a way to picture this and there's probably a better way, but this is what I came up with. Like if you think about this inverted pyramid resting on a point, it's susceptible to sort of being topsy turvy, right? So if you change the, the character and nature of God at the bottom, it's going to have an effect on everything on top of it. It might tip the pyramid one way or the other, um, or it might just redefine what we mean when we talk about the rest of these pieces of theology. Like the next thing we're going to talk about in this class is anthropology or the doctrine of humanity. Um, and if humans are made in God's image, then we need to, be carefully thinking about who God is to understand who we are. Um, it's not that we're gods <laughs> or that we're particularly like him in our fallen state, but that, that gives us like God's own identity gives us a picture of his intention for us, even if that's thwarted by the fall. And again, 
the nature of sin, the nature of salvation, and the ultimate destination toward which God is drawing us. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about salvation. Um, that's the next slide. Um, and we've already touched on this a little bit, but I think we can unpack it some more. Um, I think in these two chapters, Reeves makes the case that if our problem is uh, disordered love, which, by the way, he gets from, among other places, Augustine um, was maybe the first after the biblical authors themselves to really unpack this notion of um, the problem that we have is that we don't love God right. Our, our desires are, are at the core of who we are as people. They, they define and drive our lives more than we realize. Um, but they, because they're twisted, they drive our lives into a train wreck. Um, and they deceive us along the way. So, um, to get that straightened out, um, God shows us how to love him, how to love him right. And so, um, salvation involves, um, first, and this is probably too small a picture, but the things that I think, um, Reeves is driving at in these two chapters in chapter three he talks about sharing in the love of God through union with his beloved son. And let me read another section. Um, Cause I think, uh, man, for, I don't know about you. Tell me this. Is this something you've heard much about? Um, that. I mean, maybe the question is, how have how have we in the evangelical church typically defined salvation? So when we could take this away for a second and just talk about that. You guys fill up the whiteboard. Oh, no. Um, yeah, I'm not going to put anything up here until... I hear your answers. To be anything. Well, anything you've heard all your life. Liz. Be sure that you have everlasting life. That's one thing I've heard. Yeah. Uh, typically understood as what I mean? What is that? How how do how do we often define everlasting life? In terms of salvation, that you know you're going to go to heaven. Okay, in heaven, wherever that is. Okay. <laughs> Matt. Um, more recently, I've it's been emphasized to me that. Um, that the everlasting life just doesn't begin in heaven. It begins as soon as you're saved. Your eternal life is renewed immediately. <laughs> and that's when the eternal life, your everlasting life begins. Yes. Good. Good. Because your spirit is renewed and that's when you're reunited with God who is the source of all life. So you, your spirit never dies. Okay, you just did the 
second point of this whole lecture in like 30 seconds. Good job. Uh, anything, anything else? For salvation, at least, at least, I mean, Nancy. Um, well, I was taught that it's deliverance from harm or ruin or loss and from sin and, and the grave and from destruction. And it's, you know, to the Christians to be uh, brought to faith in Christ. So... Okay, yeah, that's, there's a lot there. Um, and a lot of those are part of the picture. I'm going to mute you again because I'm hearing my own voice in your, through your speaker. Oh, you got it. Okay. Anything else? There's, there's like six people in that classroom. Somebody has to have another idea. What have we been told about salvation? What is it like? Uh, like, what does God do about our sin? Hannah says he takes it away. Okay, taking away sin. I'm going to call that forgiveness. <laughs> That's a big part of it. Um, I think says being born again. Yes. That's, that's, we're going to get to that too. Uh, that's kind of what Matthew was talking about with the new life. Communion with Christ and the Holy Spirit. Well, with God, because you also have communion with the Father. How about Trinity? And let's spell it right. Okay, Nancy again. I was just going to say redemption. Ah, yes. So that's like uh, from old life, slavery. That's the God buying us back, right? These are all good biblical images of salvation. Um, one that gets a lot of press is this idea of um, justification or being justified uh, or put in the right, um, which is often linked with having our sin, our penalty, Paid. Is this is this you can even just raise hands or shake heads? Is this something you've heard a lot about, Matthew? Yeah. yeah. Um. And I think this, although it's true, um, I mean it's it's an important biblical image. Sometimes it gets put in the center, and. It sort of correlates to that um, that line in the chart where God is ruler and judge, right? And what Reeves is saying is that's all true, but it fits within a bigger picture. And I think sometimes the idea of like the legal transference of us from guilt to innocence and um, from unrighteousness to righteousness uh, becomes this like the central governing metaphor and everything else falls underneath it. And I think what Reeves is trying to do is make, um, make maybe this communion with the Trinity, the central overarching uh, reality that everything else gets subsumed underneath. So being being caught up in the love and life of Father, Son, and Spirit 
is the main thing. And that res that issues forth in everything else on this list. So I'm glad you guys brought this one up. Um, but in my experience, uh, up until recently, it hasn't been like the main thing we talk about or the main way we talk about salvation. And I guess that's what I want to um, key in on is like, I don't know if we'll answer the why question of why that is, but how does that square with how scripture actually talks about our problem and our solution. And the reason why we're talking about this, this, this sounds like soteriology, right? The doctrine of salvation. But the, the point that Reeves is driving out through this whole book is, is back to the, um, you know, the PowerPoint triangle where this flows out of what we say about who God is. Um, so let's take, I think it's a good time. We're about halfway through to take a few minutes and stretch and think and process what we've said so far. And we'll come back, let's say at 1133 and pick up where we're leaving off. I think this is kind of a way to summarize what Reeves is trying to say in these two respective chapters. The, in the first, we share in the love of the triune God by union with the son. Um, and then in the chapter on the spirit, he talks about how we share in the life of God through the fact that he gives us himself in the person of the spirit, uh, who is the giver of life. So I want to just dip into a couple uh, of places and read some, some more passages from the book and then kind of unpack them a little bit. And uh, you guys are answering questions when I ask them, but feel free to uh, pipe in and pipe up and raise your hand and or uh, you know step up to the laptop and uh, raise a question or or make a comment. Um, this doesn't have to be a monologue. But on the first point, um, I'm looking at page 75 where he says this in the middle of the page, the spirit takes what is the son's and makes it ours. When the spirit rested upon the son at his baptism, Jesus heard the father declare from heaven, you are my son whom I love with you. I'm well pleased. But now that the same spirit of sonship rests on me, but now that same spirit of sonship rests on me. The same words apply to me. In Christ, my high priest, I am adopted, beloved, spirit-anointed son. As Jesus says to the Father, you have loved them even as you have loved me. Um, and I think if, so those words for Jesus, in my view, were hugely definitive for his entire life and for his ministry. It was his knowledge that he was loved by the Father, um, chosen, um, related as son, right? And that has a whole range of meaning, but uh, in this scenario, it's not just that he's the, mess the messianic, king the son of god but that he um the father speaks and says you're loved and i delight in you and as reeves has been saying this is like this is what's been going on between father and son for all eternity um but we as humans we tend to doubt <laughs> that very fact i mean that that was part of the mistrust that happened in the garden right is God really for us? Does God really love us? Are we really his children? Is he trying to keep something from us? The serpent seems to think that there's something to be had out there in that tree, something that's uh, desirable for gaining wisdom um, and for, for, you know, 
tasty food? Like, w what's he trying to hold out on us? And so the, the temptation has always been to doubt the love and sufficiency of God and, and his own delight in us. And that's what drives us to the disobedience. And so Jesus' whole life was defined by his, uh, his rock-solid faith that God loves me. God delights in me. I'm his child. And that changed everything. And that was the, the root out of which his obedience grew. So the, the fruit of the Spirit in his life, the fruit of um, obedience to God's law, to love God and love people, was grounded in his trust in his Father's love. And that's what he's trying to help us see when he teaches. God is generous. God is gracious. God uh, is concerned about you. You don't have to worry. Um, you don't have to judge others because God's going to take care of it. You can love your neighbor because that's what your father does. I mean, all of it. <laughs> um, we, we, we talk about the Sermon on the Mount often as like this super high standard. Who, who, could, who could ever do that? But the one who could do that is the one who believes that they're the beloved of the Father. Um, so when we realize that those words spoken about Jesus are also have significance for us who are united with him, then in the same way, over time, that truth begins to work on us. It begins to change our fruit and uh the produce of our lives so does that make sense um i'm gonna take that as a yes um and again we said this the other day how important is that concept of a father um you know the people who often turn out to be vicious tyrants or hardened atheists who have a have a um a bone to pick with god are the ones who have never experienced what it is to be loved by a father um and so god wants to draw us into that to help us experience that particularly if we haven't um so then in the next part he talks about um, the spirit being the one who shares God's own life with us. And I was brought back to um, the notion that we've talked about in with God's revelation of his name. You know, and we read about this in Comer's book. Um, when God tells Moses, I am who I am, he says, I am the living one and I am the one through whom everything has life and that was Jesus God like um, G Jesus says at one point in John God is the one who has life in himself and he's given to the son to have life in himself and to share that life with others and if you start re if you sit down and start reading the Gospel of John and just circle the word life or eternal life every time it comes up, you'll be amazed. Over and over and over again, Jesus says, "I've come to bring life. I've come that they may have life. The gift of God is eternal life." You know, uh, God loved the world, sent His Son, so that they wouldn't perish but have eternal life. The whole thing is driving at. Um, God giving life. And he does that through, actually, ironically, paradoxically, through the death of his son. But then at the end of the story, and Reeves talks about this passage, he comes and breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The spirit that gave life to creation 
is the spirit that animates the new creation in Christ. And so uh, the source of all life, God himself, comes in the person of the Holy Spirit to reside in human beings, in his people. Uh, I think that's amazing. There's also this um, fascinating uh, image in John of um, of water. There's a part in Reeves where he, he talks about um, God being a fountain and like that's ever flowing with life-giving water. And that's an image that Jesus uses. He comes to the woman at the well and he says, um, you know, you're looking for life in all the wrong places. But if you knew the gift of God, which is eternal life, you'd ask me and I would give you living water. And then there, later on, as you keep reading through the story, you find out that there's an association between the water uh, and the Holy Spirit. And then there's that passage that people have pondered about and wondered about for millennia, where Jesus is on the cross and he gets he gets speared, you know, by the soldier, and out of his side pours blood and water. And people are like, well, what's the water about? Um, and there's some there's some uh, linguistic connections between that passage and the earlier passages that are talking about the spirit that s some people suggest. Um, again, this is a hard passage to interpret, but but um, what's his name? Uh, I forget the name of the commentator that makes this case um, that. That's an image of in the moment of Jesus' death, he's pouring out life, and that the water is that is symbolic, like it is earlier in the story, of the spirit that comes as a result of his death. Um, and so I think that's fascinating. Again, the whole Trinity is working together to um, to to give us the divine life. And um, in the moment of Jesus' death, that life of the Spirit is poured out um, from, like, he is the fountain of life. Um, and the one through whom the Spirit can come and enliven his people. Um, so the upshot of this is, and um, on... Page 94, uh, Reeves starts talking. He has a, a section titled Life in the Trinity. Um, he says, there's a couple quotes. And it, through the Spirit, the Father allows us to share in the enjoyment of what, what most delights him, his Son. Then on page 95, at the heart of our transformation into the likeness of the Son, then, is our sharing of his delight in the Father, and our love and enjoyment of the Son, in our love and enjoyment of the Son, we are like the Father, in our love and enjoyment of the Father, we are like the Son. The Spirit unites us to the Son, so that the Father's love for the Son also encompasses us. He draws us to share the Father's own enjoyment of the Son, and he causes us to share the Son's delight in the Father. And we've already talked about that. The Father speaks of the Son, I delight in you. And the Son says, like, my purpose is to do the work of the Father, and it, and it delights me. It's, it's my joy. It's my, Jesus even says it's my food, um, is to do the will of my Father. And so part of God's purpose in, in saving us and drawing us is to, is to uh, catch us up in this, divine dance of life and love, love and giving and fellowship and mutual delight that they share together. So to, to wrap this up, I, I want to ask the question, um, like implications for discipleship. 
he goes on to talk about this notion of kind of he comes full circle back to uh, our affections, our loves, and how um, I'll read one more quote. Everything we have seen means that uh, no, that's not what I want. Um, basically, desires matter. Um, he quotes Jonathan Edwards on holy affections. What Edwards was getting at was the fact that the spirit is not about bringing us to mere external performance for Christ. That's salvation for the ruler, judge God, right? But bringing us actually to love him and find our joy in him. Any performance for him that is not the expression of such love brings him no pleasure at all. Um, so he, and he talks about like the wife who just dutifully performs for the husband, but not because she loves him just because, I don't know, it's the right thing to do. And like, where's the joy in that? Um, Jesus tells that little parable about the guy who has two sons. And the first one says, uh, I'm not going to obey you. And then he goes out and does it. And the second one says, I'm going to obey you. And then he doesn't. Um, and clearly the first one is the one who had a heart to love his father, even though maybe for a moment he didn't want to. Um, so um, our desires drive our behavior, and the turning of our desires is what um, kind of brings us back into this story of love. So here's a question. Um, what if our becoming um, saved, if our, um, what we talk about as discipleship, but if our, uh, our growing up into this new birth, this new life that we have as children of God, our, our, what if growing up as children of God is not so much... Hmm, is not primarily about doing, but it's primarily about delighting. And that, that delighting then produces doing. Because I don't know about you, but for me, the, you know, the way it's often been put is um, God did something great for us and so now we owe him our obedience which is true now we um, gosh if, if, if God has done so much for us shouldn't we just like at least give him a little obedience. Um, Nancy, did you have a comment? I saw your hand go up. Well, um, I just think it's just gratitude that moves us to want to obey. So out of uh, gratitude, we gr grows our love and then guides us to want to do those things. Just like when we love somebody, we want to do stuff for them. Yes. I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and I think sometimes, like, gratitude is crucial. I, I think it gets sometimes separated from um, communion, where, like, Christ came and sort of did this thing for us, or, like, he talks about the Spirit. It's not stuff that God gives us, but it's, like, himself. Um, like Christ came and he did this thing for us that was outside of us. And it was amazing. Like he paid the penalty for our sins and all that. And so we're grateful. And so we do things in return, but we're, it, there's still that, that, that whole thing can function where we're still outside of each other. Um, what it's what, uh, a guy named Baxter Kruger in an article I recently read calls the assumption of separation. 
like we're not we're related to God and we're reconciled to God but we're not necessarily united to God and therefore we're not caught up in that triune life of eternal love and life and delight that then issues forth in the kind of fruit that comes from the spirit being in us Matt so what this what this kind of reminded me of is in certain African cultures, if someone saves your life, you are indebted to them until you save theirs. Hmm. And this is something that I think it's interesting. <clears throat> it's it's kind of a distinction. The person does things for that other person because Culturally, they have to. Versus in a family, you often do things for family members because you want to. And when you're in a very close family, you do things for them because you love them and you want them to do well. Yeah. Key distinction. There, so in the cultural world of Jesus, it's sort of like that African uh framework that you talked about there's this reciprocity somebody does something for someone that they could never repay but they have to their their cultural expectation is well they'll do um as much as they can to you know sort of repay even though they know they could never repay because we we that's how we talk right jesus has paid this great debt for us like he's given his life for us, so we should lay down our life for him, and we should. But then we then we say, but we could never do like we could never match what God has done for us, which is true. But are, is that what we're really trying to do? Like, go ahead. But that's not the point. Exactly. Exactly. And but but what it can do is kind of put this crushing weight on us, right? Like th- this guy saved my life. I need to I need to die for him. And Jesus does call us to a certain kind of death. But <laughs> here's the the kicker: it's the same kind of death that he died, which he did. For the joy set before him. Not because, oh, man, these people screwed up, and the only way I'm going to get them out of this is if I, you know, go lay down my life. No, this was uh, the, the God who is love expressing himself in an, in, in an ultimate gift of self-giving. John, uh, the apostle, says, um, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus died for us. And we love because he loved us first. And our love is to be not just a a kind of a dutiful, even even if it's based in gratitude, not just a, well, gosh, I could never repay that. So... I guess I'm bound to to grit my teeth and do everything I can. No, it's we love not because he first loved us and in the way that he first loved us with this sort of joyful and my, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this joyful self-giving um, love that, that comes out of, a sharing in God's own self. That does not happen quickly. Like it takes a lifetime to get us to the point where we love like that. Because uh, back to um, till we have faces again, part of the whole point of the book is that the main character goes through life, believing that she loves people and really She's selfishly devouring people. 
she's become like the pagan gods that are in her culture that that devour um and we become like over years and decades if we if we know him and through through christ if we come to know him and delight in him and love him which is eternal life if we get that life then we begin to share that life and we begin to express his kind of love so but it begins with mutual knowing coming into fellowship with um and then having god reorder our affections i'm going to share one more thing with you um it's a two minute video about a book by james smith who's an augustinian scholar philosopher and the book is called you are what you love and it's it's a really good book but this is the little preview that introduces sort of the main idea oh i suppose you guys can't hear that no because i did not click the box that says share sound so let's try that again and once we're done this is two minutes so this will take us to the end of our time i'm so excited and honored that you're discussing you are what you love it's really a book about discipleship but it's also about rethinking discipleship and it does that from the bottom up. It goes and revisits some of our most fundamental assumptions about who we are and what we are. In a lot of ways, our standard approach to discipleship, you might say, tends to assume that human beings are thinking things. So we assume that discipleship looks like depositing all the right ideas and beliefs and doctrines into our intellectual receptacles. That's good. I'm suggesting it's not quite enough. What if human beings aren't just thinking things? What if we are less driven by what we know and more pulled by what we long for? What if we're less driven by what we believe and more pulled towards what we long for? That's why I've tried to suggest that maybe human beings are fundamentally lovers that we are made to love God, to desire God, to hunger for what God desires for his world. And I think that changes the way we think about discipleship because we'll have to start thinking about the power of habit, our dispositions, our inclinations. So what difference does it make if, instead of thinking about human beings as a brain on a stick, what difference does it make if we think about human beings as lovers, as desiring creatures? How does that change the way you think about your discipleship? How does that change the way you think about pursuing God? How does that change the way we together think about following Jesus in the world today? So, man, that raised a whole bunch of questions that would be fun to talk about, but we're out of time because I talked too much. So, um, Hopefully that'll um, whet your appetite for further conversation down the road, which we will have plenty of time to revisit these themes. Um, but that's enough for today. Thank you all for being here. And if you have anything you want to talk about for a minute, I will be, I'll stick around. <laughs>